Directors and Chair of the Board of Development Committee, Ashley DeBerry. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Directors, thank you for attending the 2022 Presidential Site Summit. It's been a remarkable week, and tonight's conclusion at the AT&T Stadium will be no exception. Our next session is titled Donor Cultivation in a Post-Pandemic Environment. Fundraising practices and strategies have changed significantly since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, as most organizations shifted away from in-person events to virtual experiences for supporters and donors. While some sites and organizations have adjusted better than others, many have and continue to struggle with this donor cultivation landscape. This session will consider such changes and discuss the best cultivation practices as we move forward in a post-pandemic world. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for this discussion, Rhett Wilson, who is the Chief Development Officer at the White House Historical Association. Joining him on stage are panelists Jason Mullahan, Director of Membership at the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream, up until last month, Jason was the Director of Development for Lincoln's Cottage, but is now with the Milken Center. Welcome, Jason. And joining him is Joe Bondi, Senior Vice President of Development at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Good to have you with us, Joe. And Amy Fury, Manager of Product Innovation for Evertrue. Welcome, Amy. One quick reminder, this session will promptly end at 3 p.m., and we will move right into our next session, maximizing site potential. Please enjoy this discussion, and thank you again. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, one of the things I want to just delve right into is the applicability of, of today's uh, conversation. We're going to make you a couple promises. One is that uh, what we'll talk about up here is going to be uh, useful for big sites and small sites. And I think the second promise is, is that you're going to walk away with something uh, that you can use regardless of whether or not uh, you're anywhere in that spectrum. So let me start off with uh, lessons learned from the pandemic in terms of how you reach donors. Now, Jason comes from Lincoln's Cottage most recently, and he had an interesting program uh, that he led there. And would you tell us, Jason, about what you did to reach your donors during the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when the pandemic struck, you know, we really were faced with a situation of how we began our reach with donors, because we really were an organization that was place-based. Um, our tour was really dedicated to the interactive dialogue that we had with the tour guests, um, with donors, and taking them through the rooms of the cottage and explaining these powerful, impactful stories um, that impacted Lincoln's time while he resided there. Um, so, of course, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. Um, so we went on a path where we created a virtual donor tour um, or a virtual tour for our donors. Um, this wasn't just something you press play um, on a web browser um, and watch, but it really facilitated that interactive discussion. We had a tour guide, a Zoom room set up with donors from across the nation that we were able to interact and engage with in these really meaningful discussions about Lincoln's leadership, Lincoln's experience there, and things that we're facing now and facing during the pandemic, racial division, um, grief and loss as a nation. Um, and this program really brought these people together in this facilitated dialogue um, on these really important, impactful issues. Um, and from that, it was such a success. We found new donors and new prospects from this event. We engaged with people from throughout the country and even Scotland um, attended one of our virtual tours that we've now even incorporated it as a benefit of membership um, at the Lincoln's Cottage. So at a certain getting, giving level, you do have this opportunity to have these impactful experiences with your friends or connections or colleagues um, and have that meaningful dialogue and discussion. And one of the elements that came away from that experience is that you found some scalability. Uh, people were inviting their friends and that sort of thing. 
Exactly, exactly. And I mean, that's what we want as fundraisers, right? And development professionals. We want to, you know, increase our networks, increase our pipelines and our prospects. Um, and giving um, that one initial donor the opportunity to bring in their friends from wherever they are and introduce the site to them in this very meaningful way, um, you know, it's going to spread like wildfire then. They're going to want to also invite their friends. Um, and those led to new opportunities, new leads, um, and basically a whole, whole new perspective to our development function and operations. Now, one of the things that we've seen a lot of in the last uh, two years is the use of video uh, proliferating much more than it had previously. Amy, what can you tell us from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us here today. So my name is Amy Fury, and I work with a company called Evertrue, and we partner with nonprofits, large and small, to increase their fundraising efforts, to build out their strategies. And one of the things that we found in the last couple of years is, is similar, that the video element has uh, really taken off. So the traditional model of fundraising is where sort of a, a pyramid of donors, it's really just that top 1% that usually gets that personalized one-to-one -one communication. And what we've found in the last couple of years is that video allows us to scale that, not just down to the next 10%, which has historically been Evertrue's sweet spot, but we've actually been able to penetrate down into the entire donor pyramid, similar to you know, what you were sharing about passing along the, the invitation to friends and family members who may also be interested in these programs. So at Evertrue, we have a, a video platform called Thank You. And this platform is one that took off in the last couple of years where we had small and large organizations that wanted to connect with their donors, with their constituents, with their followings, with their, with their members, and they couldn't do that in person. And so to bring that sort of face-to-face -face alternative, they turned to video. And what we found when they were sending out personalized, customized videos to these constituencies, that, that people responded very positively. And so we saw uh, usually a, a two times open rate on video messages as opposed to regular text-based emails. We also found, and I would, I would argue that this is the more important statistic, that the click-through rates were three times as high than a regular email. So that's not just saying that someone opened an email, but rather that they engaged with it further. And so we found that incorporating those video elements really increases the engagement and the visibility of an organization's mission and allows us to connect more closely with those donors, even when we can't be in person. And what we found even in, in recent months is that now there's an expectation and there's that desire to have that connectability, even if you can't be there in person. And so we're seeing a lot of organizations that are not, not slowing down that video, but actually ramping it up because now people are, are maybe back in, in different geographical locations, but they want to maintain that video element. And so we're seeing um, that's going to be continuing post pandemic as well. Now the video component of fundraising can sometimes be daunting because uh, an office may not have, or even a smaller charity may not have any video capacity, you no know, cameras or, or um, staff that are assigned to, to do videography. Uh, but your product is actually doesn't require any of that uh, and may, make it more authentic, actually. Hmm. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. So in my experience in the last couple of years, so often I was seeing, I mean, it was on, it was on our televisions. We saw celebrities in their houses, in their kitchens. We saw uh, people hosting television shows and their kids would run in and their dogs. There was, there was an element of authenticity and I think that it really elevated humanity in our communications and people latched onto that. And that's something that, that we have within our product that we're able to um, not only provide that authenticity but not have to have that expertise when it comes to videography. Now, of course, there is a place to have that professional videography in, in communications, um, but with these one-to-one -one or one-to-few video messages, um, we, we use mobile phones, we use webcams on laptops, and there's not a need to have a videographer element. We have elements within the platform um, that allow that, that easy, user-friendly, non-videographer opportunity to build, create, and send out those video messages without that additional professional support. What can you tell about the people who are opening these videos? Does that have an impact on 
what you know about your donors in terms of who you might prioritize and talk to first? Of course. So the second element that's really valuable about this communication is the data that we receive at the, at the end of when the communication has been opened. So we're able to extract all of that data, and we work very closely with our partners for, for those that need that additional assistance with that data analysis to help them understand how they can segment their communications and their audiences to ensure that they're communicating effectively with various constituencies. We also overlay that with our EverTrue platform, which incorporates a whole host of data points, which allows our organizations to understand the donor as a whole, so not just someone that gave to a specific fund, not just a visitor, not just a, a volunteer, but rather the person as a whole and their entire experience. And one element of that is how they've engaged with our videos. And so we're able to incorporate that and through some of our strategies internally, we can work with our partners to elevate various donor groups to know who is that best next 10% that our major gift officers will go out and, and reach out to that maybe were previously unidentified and we're finding that um, the video element is a very strong way to prospect for those new donors as well. Some of us, including our donors, are overwhelmed with email. And so uh, while this may be one strategy, um, there are other strategies that we can use to augment uh, what we're trying to do out of our offices. Uh, and, and that might include doing things uh, that, that send something to a donor that's more tactile. And I think Joe, um, you know, he's the fundraiser, the head fundraiser, fundraiser for Mount Vernon, probably raising hundreds of thousands of dollars while he sits here. He's a very effective <laughs> uh, fundraiser. It's a nice compliment, right? But he... Um, uh, he implemented something at Mount Vernon that brought video to the donors in a different way. Tell us about that concept. Yeah, and let me just uh, I want to tack one thing on to what Jason was talking about uh, relative to right after uh, the pandemic switching. You know, Mount Vernon does 300 some odd programs a year. Um, so there's something always going on. You know, March 2020, we were. Uh, had just come off a wonderful celebration of George Washington's 280th, 88th birthday uh, and headed into a whole year's worth of events. Um, we were able to switch fairly quickly to a, a virtual platform for our events and found, uh, you know, as I think many sites did, a hungry audience for that in the early going. Um, we certainly found, uh, as time went on, that audience was dwindling um, as Zoom fatigue set in. But the interesting thing is uh, we might get some small number of attendees the night of, but we kept all of our virtual programming on our website so you could go back and watch vir basically everything we've done in the last two years. And the numbers were exponential in the, in the time after that. So we might be feeling down about 200 people tuning into a book talk, but then you know, six months later, 10,000 people have watched it. Um, this is something that we're going to take forward into attempting to do more uh, in-person hybrid events, which I know is um, uh, sort of the, the, the new way of doing business. And, and keeping that library of, of all of our content on our website, I think, is, is very important. Um, we also used a strategy of reserving some of our best talks for as members only programming and uh, um, advertise those programs um, to non-members in an attempt to recruit members. And it actually was a, a great success. Um, we uh, had people signing up for membership just to be able to get access to hear uh, Joe Ellis or Patrick O'Connell, the great, the great chef who came to speak about um, uh, in Little Washington and his um, his own interest in history, um, on the on the higher end, uh, what you were alluding to in your question, Rhett, um, Mount Vernon has just launched our uh, five year uh, campaign in the fall, um, uh, 150 million dollar campaign to um, a mission a mission based campaign, uh, and we launched it with uh, a beautiful video that we had made actually during the pandemic, which had its own set of challenges with the very few visitors that we did have wearing masks and had to navigate that 
Um, but then in a tradition of Mount Vernon's campaigns sending physical media, uh, our, our uh, To Keep Them First campaign sent a VHS tape. Uh, I'm sure uh, some of you remember VHS tapes. Um, our library campaign sent a DVD. So we thought, you know, for strengthening our foundations, we really had to top it. So we, um, we sent a, uh, a video player uh, that when you got it in the mail and open it up, it just starts playing our campaign video, which is really, uh, really cool. And admittedly, it was not cheap, but I'll tell you that um, we are nearing in on $2 million in gifts that we can attribute to this player being in someone's mailbox, um, which is really, <laughs> frankly, surprised me. I just wanted to pay for it, uh, but we've paid for it many, many times over. And it's just, we were laughing about this, Rhett and I, at lunch, that, um, that uh, this can, if I was going to, if the board was going to turn us down on this because of its costs, I was going to try to find a donor for it to, to do it anyway. And these actually can be good donor opportunities uh, for, for just the right kind of donor that, that believes in building capacity. And, and uh, um, so that was going to be my strategy if we got turned down. But we didn't, and, and it's been a great success. Now, that's a six-figure project in itself, right? That's right. Uh, but the, the, if you're a smaller charity, uh, the video product through ThankView is, is much less expensive. What kind of price point do you have for that, Amy? Yeah, I mean, it really ranges based on the number of users and the size of the organization, but it starts in, in the hundreds of dollars. So it's really something that is attainable for small organizations. Now, obviously, it can grow for larger shops that want to have their entire organization be enabled with that type of platform, but it's something that, um, yeah, starts, starts at a very attainable price point. I wonder if we could talk for a moment about social media and things we may or may not have learned about uh, social media during the pandemic. How have you all found that to be helpful or not uh, in the last two years? Well, I think I'll start from the pers perspective of Lincoln's Cottage. Um, we are a very small site. Um, we don't have like a dedicated social media manager. We're juggling multiple things. Um, and social media has always been kind of a sore spot for us to how do we build that engagement on social media, um, especially among do donors and various audiences. Um, but again, you know, necessity um, is the mother of all invention, and we had to start experimenting. So um, during the pandemic, um, and, and Amy brought this up in some of our discussions too, about using volunteers and the resources you have, your interns who are younger, who are really experts um, in this field and experts in um, building these like engaging videos on TikTok or Instagram Reels um, and how that equates to, to views, interactions, um, and then eventually, you know, digging for donors through those social media platforms. So again, it's just, it's try, try, fail, try again until you find something that sticks and resonates with your, your audiences. Now, in your primary company, um, you have spent a lot of time, before ThankView was, was part of the portfolio, you spent a lot of time, Amy, uh, looking at how to mine data out of social media. I wonder if you could share with the audience about uh, what sorts of data you can figure out based on a follower of somebody on LinkedIn or Facebook or, or Instagram. Absolutely. I think there was something that was mentioned in one of the panels yesterday about technology, and the idea was that we want to be where our constituents already are. And so we come at this not from a digital-only perspective, but from a digital first. Um, I know that I, I would imagine that everybody in the audience here today has a mobile phone, perhaps a laptop with them, or a tablet of some kind, but I'm not sure how many maybe would have direct mail perhaps in there or an, or an envelope from their mailbox in their bag. We recognize that mobile and, and laptops is really where we're seeing a lot of our audiences. And even further, we're seeing people on social media. And so what we are able to do within the EverTrue platform is to overlay that social media data with the other information that you have in your database about your constituencies. So as I mentioned earlier, 
we want to paint a full picture of what our donors are interested in and what they've chosen to put their money towards and also how they volunteered and what types of events that they've been involved in. But oftentimes all of those data points are in a variety of, of locations. Some might be in a database. There might be lists or Excel spreadsheets. All of the information is strewn about and it makes it very difficult to filter based on several of those variables. So what we do within the Evertree platform is we take all of that information, we can see all of that information within a, an organization's database, but then overlay that social media element. So what we might find, for example, is that there's a donor that's been giving consistently for several years, maybe $25 a year. They volunteered a couple of times, but the funds that they've given to is, is the fund that we have asked them to give to. We oftentimes uh, pre-fill that designation space on a pledge card. But what we might also find in, in what we can search through the Evertrue platform is that on social media, this particular donor is what we say raising their hand by liking, by commenting on, by reacting to social media presence that we have in our organization on a completely different topic. So in that, we're able to recognize that we might be asking this donor to support the wrong area, that they're consistently giving to the area that they have for several years, but it might not be the area that they're truly passionate about. And so what we can take from this social media information is we can find what they're interested in. We can even make sure that as an organization, that our communication specialists or our interns, our student interns, are pushing out content on very specific topics. So I know that there are a lot of sites that are launching new programs and seeking additional philanthropic support, but don't know who those donors are that might be interested in it. So what we can do is push out that content on social media and start seeing who's, who is raising their hands. And then with that information and the information within your databases, we can start to identify those diamonds in the rough that would be interested in, in providing support for those programs. So as a way that we can pull together all of these various pieces of data, it allows us to make very strong data-driven decisions and then serve up very, what we refer to as warm leads or hot leads even for new, for new donor prospects for various programs. Can you tell from somebody who likes Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, who likes a post on there, can you tell whether or not they are someone that <coughs> often visits the Ritz-Carlton website or, um, or likes to, to search the Tiffany's or Rolex websites? Close. Um, <laughs> so we are able to overlay with the variety of, of other indicators that would essentially get to what I'm guessing you're getting at is, is really that wealth indicator element. What is the capacity of this person when it comes to what they could commit to in a philanthropic gift? There are a couple of ways that we gather that information. Some of it is where they are philanthropic in other organizations. What other kinds of organizations do they support? What do we see as their capacity for other organizations? That may give us an indicator as to what they might have capacity for within our own organizations. A couple of other ways that we're able to attribute some of those wealth indicators are things like you know, wealth screening services that we have embedded within the platform. We also have indicators that will provide additional information on assets such as planes and boats and other things that would provide uh, information on some of those wealth capacities. And then we're also able to look a little bit into, of course, you know, that what we have within the database for, you know, what have they been supporting historically so we can pull all of those pieces together and get a better idea. So it doesn't necessarily give us their search history, but it does give us an idea of their wealth and philanthropic history. Joe, how does Mount Vernon use uh, social media? Uh, well, we use social media uh, really well. We do not use it for prospecting. Um, so, uh, you know, hearing Amy talk about uh, her product um, has me thinking about th what more work there is to do. But, um, uh, you know, we have really good partners in our uh, media and communications uh, team, and they will frequently post on our behalf uh, um, pitching membership or support this particular program, attend a, a fundraiser. Um, that's, that's how we use it, and, and so from a fundraising standpoint, I would say we do not use it well. 
uh, admittedly. Um, we have a fabulous social media presence. I mean, we are putting out great original content and uh, lots of important historical messages about George Washington, the founding era. Um, but uh, how we convert that to be usable for, uh, for fundraising is, is a, a field yet to be tilled. I will just mention our, our website and our, um, we, have, we have 10 million visitors to the mountvernon.org website on an annual basis. Um, and uh, they're from every, every state in the union and virtually every country around the world. Uh, we, the most visited spot on our website is the virtual tour of Mount Vernon. So you can go and walk throughout. In fact, we even have a VR version of it so that you can put on your goggles and have a 3D experience, bump into your walls. I uh, <laughs> prefer you bumping into your walls than, than our walls, but um, it's, uh, it's amazing the, the amount of traffic, the ramp up in traffic uh, during the pandemic and especially at that virtual tour. So we see the activity is from you know 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday to Friday. This is happening in classrooms all around the country. Teachers are loading this thing up and, and taking a tour of Mount Vernon when they couldn't put their, they traditionally would have put their their students on a, on a bus and brought them to the, to the real thing. So um, uh, that's been a, a, a wonderful resource that we had thankfully had, you know, in the lead up to the pandemic, one of those things that we, we've been able to see uh, and see the continuation of the usage of it following. Now, Jason, you're taking on a new job uh, as a fundraiser right across Lafayette Square from us. <laughs> yep. Tell Neighbors. us about uh, the organization you're, you're joining. Yeah, well, I mean, first all, our kind of comment back to Joe and what he just mentioned about the website and the digital traffic and the engagement. Um, we took advantage of the, um, at President Lincoln's Cottage, um, of COVID to actually redesign our website. Mm. Um, our programs team also, you know, adapted our virtual education programs because they recognized a need um, for people who are homeschooling their kids of different ages to actually engage with our resources. Um, so our, you know, education team worked hard to kind of make our um, resources available for eight-year-olds as well as, you know, 12-year-olds and, and parents at home. Um, and we fed that information to our donors. Um, we fed those resources to our donors during this time when they needed it, and they appreciated that. They were hungry for that content. They were hungry for these resources. Um, and, you know, obviously, if you're a site out there, um, you know, do what it takes to put digital first, as Amy says, um, because the need and the demand is absolutely there. Um, but, and that's something I'm thinking about at the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream. Um, we will have a physical location opening up um, in July of 2023 um, in the Riggs National Bank building, right diagonal from the right house and across from the treasury, um, that will tell stories of the American Dream and provide resources to help people achieve their version of the American Dream. Um, just this past week, we launched a partnership with Coursera um, to give 200,000 scholarships out um, for skills-based certificates um, with companies like Google, Meta, um, IBM. So we're helping people achieve their American dream. And as we do this, um, you know, my role as a director of membership is to build a national audience and a national membership program to support these initiatives, to support these programs and people who want to give back to people to achieve their version of the American dream, no matter you know who they are and where they are. So we're looking at the resources like video engagement, virtual tours, um, how we can reach people outside of Washington, D.C. and outside of this physical location and keep them looped in and really dedicated, engaged, and active supporters um, of what we're doing and what we're building. Um, so it's a crucial part um, of the next steps for us as we build the, the visitor center to be named um, on Lafayette Square. One other event that's happened over the last couple of years, uh, I, I want to hear uh, from you in terms of whether or not it had an impact on your fundraising and, and whether or not it had an impact on your conversations. Um, following January 6th, do you feel like the donors you work with um, we're more engaged and more interested in civic education and the state of, of the sites that we raise money for? I'm at Lincoln's Cottage, absolutely. Um, you know, President Lincoln went through a contentious election, too, when his reelection election um, happened as well. There were questions of 
Lincoln postponing the election possibly because there was a war happening at the time for his reelection and he actually was afraid of losing reelection. Um, and of course we had those same type of questions, you know, in the election uh, of 2020, um, a pandemic was happening, should we prolong the election? Um, and donors were really interested in getting the historical perspective um, and the historical implications that Lincoln went through. Um, so again, it was, you know, donors were hungry for this information. They were hungry for this content. And traditionally, you know, we, we looked at Zoom fatigue. We looked at, you know, the content competition that all these streaming platforms have. There's so much information out there. There's so many things to do at home and be preoccupied with. Um, but when you have a site or information, this, you know, niche knowledge um, and information that you can give donors, they want to hear it and they want to engage with it. So the conversations definitely have changed. Um, and it was a little bit more personal because we're going through some of these same struggles today um, that, you know, history repeats itself. So, Joe? I mean, you know, Rhett, our, our donors already think the world's going to hell because we're not teaching civics and history. So, um, uh, so January 6th was just a, a, a megaphone for that. Um, and uh, I think the biggest point out of, out of the pandemic and leading through the tumultuous two years that we've been through on various topics is the extraordinary generosity of our donors um, to our organizations, to all of your organizations. Uh, Americans stepped up in an extraordinary way in 2020 and then again in 2021 um, to support sites like ours that Typically, you know, at Mount Vernon, we would typically have a million visitors. We had 250,000, and we don't receive any money from any government source. So every person who comes through that door is vital to the, to the livelihood of preserving George Washington's home and tomb and legacy. And so uh, our donors were just extraordinary in stepping up and, and helping us out in, in that very tumultuous time. I think January 6th was just another... A reminder of that, that, uh, that, that teaching the legacy of George Washington, that teaching about the founding era and, and uh, civics and civil discourse are so important to uh, this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a question about um, a peaceful transfer of power on that day. Well, guess where peaceful transfer of power came from? George Washington. We were, we were there. We, you know, we, uh, um, we were able to, you know, to, to augment that, that message that was so important that day. Thank you for that. Now, in terms of looking back on, on your experiences the last couple of years, a lot of the strategies we've talked about on the panel today are uh, ways to engage donors who are website savvy, internet savvy, social media savvy. At the end of the day, the, the folks who pay the majority of our bills in terms of uh, the folks that make the biggest donations, um, they're less likely to be in some of these platforms. Some of them are. Um, we have donors in their 90s who are um, you know, using iPads and, and very comfortable with technology, but uh, many are not. Um, what has changed in terms of how you view your major donors because of the pandemic? Well, you know, for us at Mount Vernon, it's um, it has been entirely about the personal contact. And uh, in in the year 2020, when we had to stop doing all of our in-person events, it, it sort of freed up our major gift team, as small as it is, to be in touch with donors, and not just at the highest level, but new donors to Mount Vernon, um, which led to uh, wonderful next gifts and and now two years on relationships, um, I think it, it caused us all to remember that our, our donors are people too, you know, that that, uh, they, um, that that phone call used to be a phone call to set up a visit in Palm Beach or whatever it was, but now we're not going to Palm Beach, so I'm just calling you to say thank you. I'm calling you to say uh, that check you sent really this t moment more than ever um, ha has helped sustain this institution. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the reaction we would get from that, uh, like no one's calling and thanking their donors. And, you know, this was a really good message to us that we have to keep this priority in mind. We've got to keep that personal contact uh, in mind. 
We have a, a queue here for us to take some questions from the audience, I believe. Um, we can keep going on this or we can take some questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Hi, Wendy North Cross from the JFK Hyannis Museum on beautiful Cape Cod. Uh, my question is about crypto and, and Bitcoin and are, how are you dealing with that as a form of donation? Well, Rat. oh, oh <laughs> yeah. sorry, Jason. I'll, I'll just go in and, and, I mean, as a form of donation, I, I don't think we're there yet or at the Milken Center, but um, it's it's definitely an, an interesting concept. But I'll tell you, like, one thing we are thinking of is a benefit of membership is to give out NFTs uh, at a certain level of membership um, for people who, you know, can get involved in investing or trading or something, which is, you know, foundational to the Milken Center's mission of access to capital or um, new business entrepreneurship or business ventures. Um, so it's something, you know, we're looking at these kind of digital platforms and new um, opportunities to be able to interact with donors and members. Absolutely, we are. Um, I don't know if it's there yet. If we have the questions, answers of like tax deductibility and yeah. um, all those kind of questions that, you know, the IRS doesn't even have an answer on so far. Uh, Joe, Bondi, and I, we started a group in Washington of chief development officers uh, who work in this space generally, and museums and, and National Gallery and so forth. And we, this topic came up recently in our last gathering. And um, the one thing I took away, and Joe, please uh, augment this, uh, is that there's, there are third-party vendors out there that will receive the cryptocurrency as a gift, process that transaction, and then give the cash proceeds to the charity. And from my interpretation, that's the way to go right now. Uh, and Joe, I don't know if you want to add that. We haven't been offered any uh, cryptocurrencies yet, and so it, it, we haven't had to cross the bridge. But I, I suspect that when that day came, I was going to email this group of uh, <laughs> gift officers and say, what are you all doing? And, uh, and Rhett would have said, here, try this third-party platform. That's probably the solution that we would take on. We, we, I, I know that I think we would all deal with cryptocurrency donations the same way we would uh, we do with stock, which is to say, sell it immediately and, and invest it in, with our own investment committee and investment policies and such. So um, I suspect that would be how we would deal with it. But hasn't has not come up yet. Any more questions from the audience? Let's, this gentleman here. Hi. Uh, Kent Gray from Springfield, Illinois. Curious as to if you had any other insights other than Evertrue on uh, str strategies for identifying high wealth uh, potential donors and what you've heard of, what you think works, and some uh, some ideas for the, the varied assembled here. Um, at Lincoln's Cottage, we used Wealth Engine. Um, it, it was a resource that was provided for us by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, so they use that as kind of donor indicators and um, a platform to search for, for wealth. It was pretty much done on an individual basis as we needed it. So to hear about products more like Evertrue that can do that kind of overlay um, that's a little bit more user-friendly and less labor-intensive um, is definitely something that should pique everybody's interest um, in terms of how you can be more efficient in finding um, those key indicators and those key um, prospects to reach out to. Um, but again, you can go the old-fashioned way, like the virtual tours that we did again um, led us to new prospects, and it was that in-person engagement of the friends of the friends. So um, it kind of brings you back to fundraising 101 and fundraising business. It's that interaction and that, that networking that really um, makes an impactful difference to your organization. Uh, I, I would have said both of those things, uh, Jason. We, we also use Wealth Engine. We also have a, a, a neat uh, relationship tracking um, system that we subscribe to called Relationship Science, which uh, combines all of your public information, your boards that you serve on and such, and, and so I can put in one of my board members and see all the people that she's connected to, um, it, which helps just if we're looking for a, a route to get to someone, uh, we can find what that path might be. It's kind of the LinkedIn model. Um, but, but Jason, you know, your, your point is exactly right. The, the good old fashioned to our board and our donors who are friends, who are your friends that would, that would, you know, think that Mount Vernon's mission is important and then asking them for the connection. And that's, that's been our best way to, 
identify, uh, or, or a very valuable way to identify new donors and friends. One thing I will just add to that is what you want is volume of data, whatever volume of data you can get. And if you're at a site, and there was one in particular I spoke with before the conference started, I love this particular site. It's a very enjoyable part of the country. And I spoke to the basically volunteer who runs it, and they say they have 100 donors. Um, and so what you want to do, I think, in part is get a decent social media presence, which is, is not terribly expensive to, to achieve, and figure out how you can grow your volume of people that follow you, how you, can you grow your volume of people that you can email. And all that stuff is roughly traceable. So if you have an email address, there are systems that allow you to trace it back to a mailing address. Once you have the mailing address, you can make Jason's Wealth Engine system work for you and tell you what the capacity is of your donors. So you're looking for volume of data, whether it's the data that's coming in your door as visitors, and if you're in a spot where you don't get a lot of visitors, then, it's a, then you want to get it through social media and, um, and email. And I don't know if you all want to add more to that. but I mean, I think the, the scalability part is, is exactly where it is, and thinking, too, not just about who are our current donors, but who is our next generation. And so wanting to make sure that we're not only gathering the data of our current donor database or, or those that would currently be interested, but also considering those that we want to be taking us into the future and who will be the donors of, of the future. And so making sure that we are beginning to cultivate those relationships now through the channels that they are, they are currently engaging in, um, but then having that not be a replacement for the current communication strategies, but additive to make sure that we are supplementing our strategies to reach various demographics that will help us maintain our, our current practices, but then also take us into the future as well. We probably have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Next time we're going to make these a little bit lower. <laughs> <laughs> Like me. This was fascinating. Paul raised all the questions and topics that I really had in my, my mind about development and, and how you then ultimately, which is my question, clinch the big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we, you have a lot of online presence. We have membership at all different mm -hmm. levels. You're building a next generation pipeline of, of donor. Um, but you're also, as Joe, as you're saying, and Brad, I know you do well too, you're massaging the relationships with the one potential big gift. You don't have to give us all your secrets here, but how do you end up doing that? And how long does it really take to achieve hmm. that kind of big gift? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's very anticlimactic. You know, when you actually get that big gift, like everybody's like, you know, you pump yourself up for the solicitation day. But again, like you said, all that massaging has went in for so long that by the time you have the solicitation meeting, like that donor knows what's coming. You know what you're there to do. Um, so that's the least exciting part of it. The most exciting part is the prospecting and be like, oh, he's connected to me somehow or she's connected yeah. to me. So that's who we need to start um, this relationship building with. Um, but I mean, we all have those exciting moments. And, and this, again, is just finding that one interest point, that one connection that's really meaningful for that person, what they want to see done at your organization, and the impact that that's going to have, um, and how that connects on a very personal, um, on a personal basis. We had one donor who was um, in the Carter administration, and they're very involved in the Carter Foundation. Um, so human rights and voting participation, they did a mission in Nepal for the Carter Foundation. Um, and the personal connection of just saying, you know, we're so thankful that we can walk, you know, 500 feet to our polling location, whereas so many people don't have that opportunity. So it's finding those, those touch points. Go at it, Joe. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, I love this question, Anita. You know, uh, the reality is the time to cultivation could be zero and it could be 50 years. And, and uh, it's, it's probably somewhere between that. Uh, and, um, but but, but this, is, this is true. We, we are about building relationships with our institutions that result in big philanthropy. And that can be a lifetime of engagement. So we learn in fundraising school 101, that's a joke because there's no such thing, but um, uh, that you need two key elements to get a big gift. 
capacity and inclination. And if you don't have, if you only have one and not the other, it's not going to lead to major philanthropy. Um, I can't change your capacity, but it's my job to change your inclination for the institution. Uh, I can't invent it out of whole cloth. If, if you're really into saving um, uh, the, the climate, you, you may not, I probably am not gonna convince you to make a big, big gift to Mount Vernon. But if there's a little spark there, and I bring you to the site, and I sh walk you in George Washington's footsteps, and talk about the power of education, uh, civic education, history education, um, that's part of building that, that inclination. And that can be a, a building process that, that I hand down to the next CDO, and he or she hands to the next. Uh, and that's where that 20 or 30 year relationship can come into play. Um, but it's all about, about building that inclination. Well, thank you to the panel. Uh, this has been fantastic. They now tell us we're out of time. So thank you to my <laughs> colleagues for, for this. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats. Our next session begins promptly. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome White House Historical Association Member of the Board and National Council, Robert McGee. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our second breakout session today. Uh, as both a director and a supporter of the so association, I want to offer my thanks to all of you for joining us this week. It has been a wonderful conference, and I hope you will join us this evening for the reception at the AT&T Center. Every cultural organization faces similar problems of increasing public awareness, for their institution and mission. In this, in this session, representatives from across the country will discuss how they have found success from restoring and reinvigorating the site visitation to encouraging community participation and awareness to forging new and innovative partnerships. These leaders will share their experiences and ideas on how to grow the site uh, its visibility and its accessibility. I've been asked to tell one short story about reinvigorating a site and creating a new and innovating partnership because the White House Historical Association was the beneficiary of it and I was involved in it. I was on the board of the National Trust for Historic, of a National Trust for Historic Preservation property known as the Stephen Decatur House. Stephen Decatur was a naval commander in the early 1800s who fought the Barbary pirates and became a national hero. That is why cities are named after him, like Decatur, Illinois, Decatur, Georgia, and many streets throughout the country. If he hadn't died in a duel, he might have become the President of the United States. But for many years, we grappled with the same issues that you do. Uh, although we are ideally located on Lafayette Square across from the White House, somehow we weren't as interesting as the White House and we had very few visitors. Despite our best efforts, we knew for a long time that we could no longer raise enough money to preserve the house, but we also knew we had to come up with a new plan to reinterpret the house that didn't just involve viewing rooms from behind velvet rope lines. We were fortunate to be a neighbor on Lafayette Square of the White House Historical Association. We found out that they were interested in acquiring more space while we were just interested in a lifeline. It seems to me that we approached each other at almost the same time to see if there was any interest in joining forces to work together. We soon forged a new and innovative partnership with the White House Historical Association in an agreement that we worked out. The association assumed responsibility for the stewardship of the house. 
but the trust retained the ownership of the house. And by doing that, the rich history of Decatur House was preserved. The Historical Association found many uses for the house, including social gatherings, staff space for our education department, and as a home for the newly established David Rubenstein National Center for White House History. Over the years, the Rubin Center, Rubenstein Center has become an important component of our association's mission. It now attracts scholars, teachers, historians, and reporters from throughout the country who want to learn more about the White House and the people who live there. And as you heard this morning, the Decatur House has also played an important role in our study of slavery, both in the White House and Lafayette Square. So it was a win-win situation for both organizations. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for this session. Our moderator for this panel is Jamie Boskett, President and CFO of the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Joining him on stage are Dr. Sarah Bone Carter, Executive Director of James Monroe's Highland House, Charles Hyde, President and CEO of Benjamin Harrison Presidential Site, and Christy Weinenberger, Executive Director of the Rutherford B. Hayes Library and Museums. Please join me in welcoming all the speakers. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're thrilled to be together with all of you, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be with uh, my wonderful colleagues. Um, we have, I think, a, a really useful, both practical and uh, philosophical uh, panel for you this afternoon as we talk about something that truly impacts us all, the need to uh, drive awareness, the need to build and strengthen visitation, both to fulfill our missions at our respective sites, but also in support of the sustainability of our institutions. The panel this afternoon is going to address, as I mentioned, some big ideas. We want to start in the clouds, and then we're going to work our way back down to something very specific and very practical that we, that we hope, you know, considering the various sizes and, and scopes of the sites represented here, uh, will be something that's easily taken away and useful for all of you. Or at very least, us saying it out loud reinforces our direction as sites and what we're doing. Uh, before coming to the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond, I was at Mount Vernon for 10 years. And so I, uh, I, I would assume that my relation with this distinguished panel comes in part from uh, my own work uh, as Vice President for Guest Engagement there in working with a, a, a remarkable team at Mount Vernon that was on a relentless quest of getting people through the gate. Uh, I can say that now, having left for five years, it's part of my counseling. Uh, <laughs> but uh, getting 1.1 million people through the gates every year is, is a, tough, a tough job. Uh, but we had developed a really strong programmatic portfolio that spanned um, any number of approaches. I would say the, the heavy, meaty, programmatic elements the, that were really fundamental to the story of the place, and some admittedly not so meaty and heavy. That's sort of the uh, tours and activities to speak to the specific history of the Washingtons at Mount Vernon, to the enslaved community at Mount Vernon, all the way through to the, the lightest of light uh, holiday fireworks. But it takes all shapes and forms uh, to draw people in, to build those on-ramps uh, to these historic properties. Uh, now I have the privilege of being in, in Richmond at the State History Museum. And through self-awareness and an understanding and building a strategy for what that site can and should do, uh, a great deal of our focus has been on community engagement, very specifically and locally to the institution. Uh, for, for all the strengths, being the oldest cultural organization in Virginia, founded in 1831, just as a sidebar, James Madison was our first member Chief Justice John Marshall was our first president, so we've been around for the better part of two centuries. Uh, but for much of that, operating is a bit of an exclusive club for the few. Uh, so in the current work that is underway for us, we've started to build bridges and trust relationships in our community. Uh, we have uh, developed a community engagement function as a satellite of the president's office. 
And we're in the process right now of doing a, working on a $50 million renovation that one of the hallmarks of it is a community convening center, a place where community organizations and partners for us can call a home base uh, to feel a strong and lasting relationship to the museum institution. So again, the, the point there is that the engagement, driving awareness, and visitation can take all forms. Um, so now I wanna, I wanna get to our panel here, and in hearing these professionals talk as we convened prior to this session, I was really struck by the overlap, but also the uniqueness in the approach of each of these presidential sites. And if I was able to give you in the most generic form the sort of magic recipe that seemed to be, it seemed to be sort of one part uh, focused on the reality and the truth of the story, the story of the people being represented, of the site, and of the institution. One part focused on the physical assets, the place, the infrastructure, and one part, of course, on the needs and the wants of the audience that's served. And if you get that right, you find your inroad into those various pieces that seem to be something of, of great success. So let's get into this. Uh, philosophical approach. I want to talk first about the sort of big idea, Sarah. In, in our conversations, um, you spoke so beautifully about uh, the, the, the focus on research and following the truth mm. uh, at Highland. Share yeah. more. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Bob. Thanks all for for hosting this conversation. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, I arrived at Highland nine and a half years ago, and the, to me, the first step in uh, developing the site, which really is, is quite a small site, and it uh, really is less developed than you would think, being a, a president's home from the founding generation, um, my first step really was to consider what were the stories we were telling? What were we focusing on about James Monroe? How are we telling Monroe's story? How are we defining it? How are we explaining it? How are we using it to share American history? And then from that to what were our stories about this place? Okay, I think one of the things that most of us share is place-based history. And what did we know about this place and how how were we portraying it? Well, as it turns out, Highland's story really um, hadn't been that well understood. Um, and I should say, too, you might know the site formerly as Ashlawn or an interim period of Ashlawn Highland. Um, and then uh, about half a dozen years ago, we took back the name that Monroe used for the site. And that was part of the story that I'm, I'm getting to today. But really, the idea of, of what did we know about the site? What could we be sure of? And how did, we, how did we pursue that? And well, you know, I think many people probably already know that the house that when you visited 10 years ago, the house that you saw, people would say, this is a remnant wing of Monroe's main house built in 1799. And the larger part of the house had been destroyed by fire and here's what we have left. Well. Actually, uh, once we dove into the research, combined architectural history, archaeology, which is my background, I'm an archaeologist, um, and then finally dendrochronology, or tree ring dating, we were able to say that little house is not a part of Monroe's main house. That little house is the 1818 presidential guest cottage built by enslaved men, Peter Mallory and George Williams. And at the same time, the 1799 main house is this beautifully preserved set of archaeological remains right here, just inches below the ground surface, waiting for us to explore it more. And so that's where we landed. And turns out that that quest for the truth um, it just opens us up to a whole new set of stories and our whole new direction. And it's about discovery, and it's about authenticity. Um, and I would say they're, they're you know, there is a moment of courage when you get to the point where you're like, you know, I think that house is not what people have thought it was for over 100 years. Um, and you think you're going to pull some, some tree ring samples out. You're going to do that drilling and pull those cores out. Once you do that, there's no refuting what you're going to find out. And so I, I really put the credit on our advisory board 
uh, the administration of William and Mary for saying, you know, now that you've brought this to our attention, not only do we support you, but we agree it must be done. The truth is important. Um, no matter what we find out, this is the direction we need to go in. And it's powerful. It's yeah. powerful. Now, I'm uh, closer in a location to your site than I am our other two panelists, but I know that the story has gotten uh, widely disseminated, so that the power of driving awareness and interest in your site through this focus on authenticity and research is, um, I think you've proven the direction that you're going is, is uh, a strong one and something that's going to Well, last. thanks. And I'll add just before we move on that also the idea that we don't know all there is to know yeah. about history. We can still ask new questions and we can still create new stories. Well, it's exciting because there's more to come, right? Yeah. There's, there's more to learn. Yeah, stay to tuned. <laughs> Charlie, I want to turn to you next. Um, you have talked a lot about your focus on Harrison and the unique role that he is this unique club, the video at lunch today, I just loved. It, it sort of amplified this notion of only one in a very few have been in the seat that, that Harris and others were. So how has that translated to your site in driving awareness and interest? Well, first of all, let me thank all of you for being here and the White House Historical Association for hosting us. So it's, it's great to have an opportunity to be along, uh, alongside so many talented colleagues. But as we, as we were looking at Harrison's legacy, um, he's the only president elected from Indiana and centrally located in downtown Indianapolis, Indiana, a gorgeous Italianate home. There's a phenomenal collection of over 10,000 artifacts in that 10,000 square foot house. So as stewards, we recognize we have an important charge um, for that National Historic Landmark property and that phenomenal collection. But as we were thinking about the role of Benjamin Harrison as a president of the United States, we thought about it in the larger context of the presidency. So if you want to frame this out in a certain way, you could, you could look at it as, you know, in, over the course of American history, there have been over 500 million citizens. Of those, just over 12,000 have served in Congress. I think we're up to about 115 that were on the Supreme Court but only 45 of those individuals in 46 administrations have actually been president of the United States. So 45 out of a half billion people. So there is something exceptional about each of those individuals, some reason why their fellow citizens called them to the highest office in the land. And that merits further study, greater scrutiny, and it was really a, an important jumping off place for us as an organization and the way we were thinking about Harrison's story and how we could contribute to the larger community. And so it put us in a position where we were working from that assumption. It caused us to ask questions of ourselves where we could contribute meaningfully, thinking about ideas of leadership, you know, specifically utilizing the story of the American presidency to help out frame out these questions of what it means to be a leader, a good leader, a bad leader. Um, and I think as we've seen with the American presidency, you have leadership, great leadership, bad leadership, oftentimes somewhere in between. <laughs> and so it really calls us all to, to ask more difficult questions of ourselves and to be really thoughtful about how we can contribute um, to our larger community. Wonderful. And, and again, not to give it away, but the approach here is we're talking about these big ideas. As we go around here in just a moment, we're going to really dive in deep to some specific examples of how this is translated into programs. Uh, Christy, uh, in, in talking with you, I was, Im well, really impressed, also leading an organization, of your incredible focus on your strategic plan and thinking through uh, the, how you're allocating your resources and what that does to drive the, the programmatic outlay of your, of your institution. Share some more, if you would, in this sort of big idea of how you're shaping your vision. Right. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, just a note about Hayes Presidential for maybe some of you who haven't been to our site. Um, we're located in a rural area, a little bit off the beaten path. Um, a small community, um, and Hayes only ran for one term as president. So um, he's not one of the more well-known presidents. Um, and so when you think about in terms of us trying to reach those national audiences as well as those local audiences, you know, we've, we've kind of got our work cut out for us. 
Um, the strategic plan for us plays a key role, um, and it, it, it strikes me as I, we're now approaching the end of, of the conference, um, and I realize we as panelists are between you all in a very fun party at uh, <laughs> Dallas Cowboys Stadium tonight, so thank you for being here. Um, you know, I, I couldn't scribble notes fast enough during some of these sessions, right? And I'm going to go back and realize, you know, I've, I've got to get to work. I'm inspired. There's all these things I need to do. But recognizing that those resources that I have at Hayes Presidential are finite. Um, you know, the biggest presidential site among us, I've never heard say, yeah, we've got plenty of funds. We've got plenty of staff. Um, you know, we're, we're good. We have unlimited resources, right? No matter our size, we have limited resources. Mm -hmm. So for us in our strategic planning processes have been extremely key in being realistic about what those uh, resources are and how we can most capitalize on those. Um, I read uh, in, somewhere in the past year a uh, um, uh, story about Steve Jobs and, and Apple, and he said, well, Apple is, a, is successful for what it says yes to as for what it said no to. And so I think a strategic plan has really helped us focus on what's important. I keep my, our strategic plan on my desktop. And if staff come in and say, because we have to be very creative, we're, we're really good at thinking outside the box, and, and it's not for a lack of ideas. Um, you know, so staff will pop by my office, we brainstorm a little bit, I'm like, this is great, this is great. Let me click on the strategic plan. Let's see, where does this fit? Uh, do we need to swap out some programs? Do we need to, to modify some programs? You know, how, is this now the better idea? How do we accommodate that into the strategic plan? But there's also a marketing aspect to all of this, too. And um, I think not only do we try and maximize our resources based on the content in our programming and what we offer, but we also, that really dovetails with our, with our marketing. Um, do people see themselves expressed in the stories and in the themes that we are including in our content? But do they also see themselves and can they connect with the messaging that is being put out in our marketing? And so those are kind of the things that I'm keeping in mind all the time at the front of my mind and how we best maximize what we can offer to the public. And that notion of relatability is a tough nut to crack, <laughs> but it's an important one with sites like this. So now that we've, we've talked at a high level, let's, let's drill down a little more and talk specifically about examples of success, programmatic or other initiatives of these institutions that have helped with driving awareness and visitation. Uh, I, I'm going to ask each of my uh, fellow panelists here uh, to give us a success story, a single specific success story or initiative. Um, and also, I'd like them to talk about a non-success story. Uh, and I'm not going to say a failure, because it's something that, that doesn't work now may work tomorrow. Uh, something that works at one site may not or may work at another. Uh, this is not a gotcha question. Uh, this is a way for us to, um, to share of what we've learned as we're continuing in this, this constant quest for getting people to our sites and sharing the story and the mission. Sarah, let's start with you. Yeah, so I would say that this phase of discovery really launched a new period at Highland. Um, we, uh, you know, started talking about learning new things about history. Like, we don't know everything there is to know, and, and moving beyond the canon of this is what we thought we knew. And so the idea that... Um, our questions are new, our stories are bigger than we thought, really has given rise to this phase that you heard about this morning from my colleague, friend, and collaborator, Jennifer Stacy, um, of, of collaboration with a, a descendant community that um, had been there all along that we had not been working with, and that our whole idea now of, of what Highland stories are, our idea of of what American history is. Those have all evolved, right? And so I think at this moment, we are telling American history through a presidential site and through presidential stories. And the American history that we're telling is inherently inclusive. And so this has really directly, um, it's, it's been a one-two really right into one another. Jennifer related this morning um, how her cousin, George Monroe Jr., reached out to us um, after the big news stories about the archaeological discovery. 
Um, and that really started the phase of, of collaboration through a long period of, of figuring out how to do this through um, the, the National Trust in Montpelier Summit, um, leading us through the thinking. George and I were able to participate in that and then the development of the rubric, really defining how we move forward together in sharing um, this responsibility of this historic place. And so it's really created um, this, new, this new phase, this new um, conviction of what American history is. And, uh, you know, it's not all been... Um, you know, we all have our moments of like, oops, that wasn't the right thing to do at the right time. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think about, and I think about it frequently, is um, kind of early on we had a program um, where we do what a small site does, right? We, we sort of get in contact with a big name speaker, um, someone who does a great presentation, maybe can draw an audience, get a community sponsor, or you get some funding and so you could do something you wouldn't normally do. We roll out this program. In this particular instance, our community turnout was really low, like embarrassingly low, and it was just not successful. Um, and you know, having done the things that we thought you do, right? You choose somebody who's well known. You choose you you know get somebody to help help make it happen. Um, but I think what I learned from that is that it doesn't always have to be the big name or the big program. Um, Sometimes it's what the community wants or what the community wants to partnership with. And I think it's, you know, it, it should always be what the community wants and often the partnerships. So our community partnerships are much more authentic, I think, now, close, you know, on the ground, really um, what people want to do. You know, we host a summer camp, a day camp, for example, with a local um, language education center. Um, so the kids are there doing Spanish day camp or French day camp and using our property and learning history. Or we have um, community partners in an American Girl Tea that is beautifully um, not overproduced, right? Very simple. And these are things that people clamor for. Um, and so really kind of sticking close to our, our center of gravity, sticking close to where the authenticity really resides is, is pretty important. That's a pretty delicate way of a non-success story. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, how about you? A success and a non-success. Well, as, as Christy and Sarah have shared, you know, this idea of know thyself and know thy president um, certainly helps. And so being authentic to your organization, understanding your bounds, uh, making sure that you have given the time and attention and thought to articulating through strategic planning, um, understanding where those strengths are, where you can work to improve upon yourself, and so I've been with the Benjamin Harrison Presidential Site for just over seven years. I've got a phenomenal team. Um, actually, a number of them are here um, this afternoon. Um, honored to work with them. Um, but you know, going back seven years as I'm trying to really make sure that I'm understanding the organization and the challenges that it was having, um, it became apparent that we were an exceptional education organization. And so one of the things that we have done so well, continue to do really well, is focus on youth education. And so in a typical year, non-COVID year, uh, we would have 17 to 18,000 school children coming through the museum. Um, so you know, speaking to the success story, that certainly is a success story in and of itself. But one of the challenges that we had was making sure that the larger community understood how we were investing of ourselves in that youth education, history, and civics community. And so as we were thinking through our strategic planning process, as we were developing a new five-year strategic plan, um, we realized that we, we had a lot of assets that we had developed that could be brought together into a powerful new program. And so that, that initiative started off as something called Future Presidents of America, which is a youth leadership camp as it's become um, for young adults between the ages of 12 and 16. It gives us an opportunity to share the leadership stories of Benjamin Harrison as a starting point, but more broadly, presidential leadership through the stories of 45 different leaders who arrived at the presidency in very different ways and left the presidency in very different ways. So being able to draw from that education expertise and the really strong staff that we had in place um, transformed the organization from the inside out. And it, what it didn't mean, it didn't mean that we were, it didn't mean that we lost any focus on the stewardship aspect of our work. You know, of course, the, the museum itself 
Um, this is a phenomenal asset. Uh, we have a tremendous collection. We found many other ways to share our collection in, in new and innovative ways. So it's not that we, we push that piece aside. It's just we understood that the way that we could engage the larger community and get them to understand the nature of our work was through this initiative. So I, th I think that uh, kind of a story within a story on future presidents of America. Um, one aspect of it is the way, as I mentioned, that it transformed our organization. Um, in our inaugural class of that program, um, the, the young leaders were so engaged, um, one of them brought his parents to the organization. They got very engaged in turn, and actually, you know, through over the past seven years, you know, ended up joining the board, and um, his mother ended up being our board chair, so just rolled off last year um, from that board leadership role. So it's, it just speaks to the way that when you're authentically engaging with your community, when you're drawing from your strengths and your assets, when you're assessing where you can contribute most powerfully to the larger community, the sky's the limit. I mean, of course, you have limited resources, you have limited staff, you have to have focus and discipline and understanding what you're able to accomplish. But I think that if you can find these models of success, and it doesn't mean that you always have to invent it. I mean, look for best practice in other organizations. See who's doing something well. I mean, we are so proud, for example, um, that we've been able to partner with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum and Library and Andrew Jackson's The Hermitage with the Future Presidents of America program, that we've been able to share that model, and they're now leading the way with their own classes of Future Presidents of America. It's something that we would love to be able to continue to grow and expand into the future. Um, and we're thinking about this holistically. We're thinking about these other ways, these things that we have done well and drawing cautionary tales from things that maybe don't work out quite the way that we would expect. Um, so Jamie, I'll, I'll be game and I'll make sure to, to share <laughs> one of those stories. Um, some of you may have heard me share in the past about our experience uh, serving as a polling site. And I don't think we have time for me to get into that today. Um, but if you look up Smithsonian Magazine um, online, proud to be a polling site, you can read that story. Um, we found that as a really powerful way to engage meaningfully, authentically with our community um, as a polling site uh, for voting. Um, and one of the things that it suggested to us is that there was a lot of work that was happening in the civic space that we were all assuming that each other were doing but weren't necessarily doing. And so it occurred to us, you know, who is out there advocating for jury service? Again, not the most exciting thing in the world, right? I mean, I think even uh, jury service made it into one of the levels of hell in a Super Bowl commercial, right? So not, not a lot of advocates apart from judges out there that are, that are encouraging jury service. So we actually had a jury appreciation day. We worked with um, the county courts, um, had their judges out. They served ice cream for jurors that had served in the preceding year. And, and I would say it, it accomplished what we hoped in the sense of showing appreciation for those jurors but not at the scale that we hoped that it might. And, you know, pandemic hit soon after, and so we've not been able to have the momentum with that idea the way we hoped. And so it, it suggests to us that we probably need to go back and rethink how we've structured that idea. So it's, it's not one for the, for the junk pile, it's one for the recycle bin, right? We, we need to rethink it. We need to think about how it's timed, how it's structured. Um, maybe those relationships with you know, judges at a county or a statewide level. But I think that the core concept is sound, but we need to find a more compelling and sustainable way to be able to accomplish it. So the big question, Charlie, did you have an, enough people show up to actually form a jury? <laughs> <laughs> we did. Okay, good. All right, six, seven. <laughs> Christy? So... Um... You know, I, Charlie and Sarah, we've been there many times where you think you've put together this wonderfully meaningful, impactful program and, you know, attendance just isn't, isn't what you were hoping for. Um, but Charlie, you know, you were talking about how um, rare it is to become president in the United States. And I think uh, just because our site is the home and museum and library of a president, you know, just in and of that self is not necessarily going to attract the largest audience that we're trying to reach. Um, you know, we get our people that are checking off, doing all the presidents, you know, presidential enthusiasts. Uh, Rutherford Hayes was Civil War general, so we get our Civil War buffs. 
but really thinking of our impact and how to reach those wider, widest possible audiences, um, you know, we have really tried to hone in on humanizing President Hayes. And I've heard a lot of you, I, I've been to many of your sites and tours where you're, and programs where you're doing this. Um, so many of you are doing it so wonderfully, and we, we've even heard about some of that in our sessions um, in, in, as part of this conference. But um, one of the things that we try to do, I guess, in, in humanizing Hayes and, and thinking of those compelling stories that can really appeal to a wide audience, we have taken a lot of time to research our audience, almost as we would donor prospect. Um, you know, we put that amount of time and care into researching our, our audience. And uh, as we were going through, going back to strategic planning, um, as we went through our most uh, recent strategic planning process, we discovered as we were researching some of the demographics of our of our county and, and, and looking at our county health department website, we discovered something called a community health improvement plan that had just been posted like like the month before uh, we were looking on the website. And I, I hadn't I wasn't familiar with it, I hadn't really heard a lot about it. Well, the number one issue, this it was a community health improvement plan that you know all these People in the community had been part of mental health professionals, uh, you know, physicians, uh, all different kinds of people. We had not been part of it. Um, but um, as I was reading the plan, it really struck me the number one issue that this group of people identified was affecting people in Sandusky County, where our so site is located, was mental health issues of mental health. And in, under that mental health bracket, the number one issue or number one concern that they had identified was um, stigma, mental health stigma, which I was surprised. I'm thinking, is, mental, is that still stigmatized? But it is. Um, and this was something they were calling out in the plan. Well, we looked at our stories uh, about Rutherford Hayes that we tell you know, Rutherford Hayes' sister was institutionalized for um, severe depression and she had lost a daughter at a young age. Uh, she suffered from most likely postpartum depression as well. We just had never, we knew it, everybody knew it. We had never really talked about that before. And we started having conversations among our staff. You know, we're not mental health professionals. It wasn't, um, uh, uh, you know, we didn't feel like we could start doing mental health programs, but how could we draw on stories that we already knew about and could connect those and, and help move the needle on stigma uh, mental health stigma in our community. And um, our manuscripts creator, you know, she said, actually I'm thinking of this letter that I read, you know, within the past few years that um, was written by uh, Dr. Rice, uh, who's from Fremont. He was a, a physician in the Civil War, and he was giving a speech. We have his handwritten notes of the speech in our collection um, where he was addressing a crowd, a, a, a reunion of Civil War soldiers in Fremont. And at the end, he gives this rousing speech, patriotic, you know, thank you for your service. In the last two paragraphs, he says, I know you all are turning to chemical substances to quiet those mental images in your mind. I had never, right there, I'm staring at the page, I'm seeing these words, it's right there in our collection. Why haven't we, talk, why haven't we told this story before? Why haven't we talked about this? Um, we, that year, um, we, we have a Civil War winter camp. Uh, that we set up at the back part of our property. And we asked the reenactors because, we said, can you address this issue? We showed them the letter. And they, oh my gosh. Uh, they wanted to talk about it. So they, as part of the Civil War camp, as people were moving through, not only were they doing their usual drills and things like that, but they started talking about mental health issues that Civil War veterans had. And we, Fremont, as many of us, are also dealing with an opioid epidemic. Um, there was an opioid epidemic after the Civil War because the soldiers were getting addicted to morphine at the battlefield hospitals. So we addressed that issue also as part of our Civil War camp. So it was putting all those pieces together and, and again, maximizing tapping into those resources um, that we already had. Um, we also um, have been paying attention to um, tourism trends. This is kind of under that same mental health bracket. Coming off of COVID, um, there was a Kaiser family study that was done, which we also discovered as part of this most recent strategic planning process that we went through. Uh, prior to COVID, one in 10 Americans said they regularly struggled with mental illness. Since COVID, it's four in 10, 40% mm -hmm. of Americans. And if you look at messages coming out of the tourism industry and, and many other industries, 
people need respite. <laughs> they need a break. I mean, we all have issues that we know need more work and we need to get to work and, and, a deal and, and a deal and address these things. But we also need a break. Spiegel Grove, we have the benefit of 25 acres. We have a mile of walking trails. We had to think a little bit differently than our traditional museum selves. Spiegel Grove is sitting right here. In a matter of marketing, we could talk about that being a respite site. Come and sit on our benches, enjoy the trees. Um, you know, uh, so thinking of Spiegel Grove not just as a museum, but as a respite site um, has become important for us as well. Um, I, I think this is, this, so it's great. Again, to come back to this idea of uh, a focus on the story, a focus on the place and the physical assets that we have, and focus on community. And you've hit a couple of them with your, with your story. Really quick, Christy, before we, we go on to the next piece, um, your non-success story. Very quick. So our non-success story, so we, um, <laughs> it involves Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. All non-success stories start with Pokemon Go. <laughs> um, when Pokemon Go was kind of having its moment, um, we had hundreds of people on our site at any given time. Um, some of our traditional walkers are saying, oh my gosh, where are these people coming from? We thought, could we connect with all these gamers in some way? We thought about putting signs on our property, like, you know, how, how do we connect them to, how do we get them inside our doors in some way? They're coming, they're walking around our site, how do we get them in our doors? We couldn't really ever figure that out. If, and, and thinking about iCivics and, and one of the earlier presentations, had we taught, focused more on gaming and reaching to them through, through gaming somehow, we may have been able to do it. But um, that still bugs me that we had <laughs> all these people on our site couldn't really find a way to get them into our building, couldn't engage with them. But Recycle them. I love that. Yes. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> All right, we have just a few minutes left, and then we'd like to take some questions. So be, please be thinking about your, your question you might have for the panel. Uh, but I'd like to do one last very quick round robin to our three panelists and be a little more forward-thinking, uh, you know, forward-looking, really. Uh, I'd like to know one aspirational thing. You've shared, you've shared with us a success, and they're all you know, innovative and specific to your sites, and I love that. What's the next thing that you have, if you could sort of wave a magic wand, you could pull off? Uh, that would be your next success story two years from now at this panel. Sarah? Yeah, so, you know, I'm scanning my list there, but uh, we, during the pandemic, um, completed the first phase of our reinterpretation of our site, that is, new exhibitions in the, in the standing guest house, the one that we no longer try to stuff that Monroe main house legacy into, um, all now self-guided an important component for not um, crowding groups through the um, small interior spaces. Um, and we're working with exhibit designers now, exhibit and program designers, to create phase two of that, to continue those on the exterior spaces. Um, you know, really trying to think about, in the programming sense, what our community members want, right, with our two main audience components, one being the local community who may come regularly for programming, um, and then the ones who might be coming through maybe as history buffs, presidential history, that kind of thing. Um, and so if we could land a set of um, new exhibitions and programs that really bring people and inspire people and um, really engage them in... Uh, in exploring an inclusive American history, that will that will be success. And there's several pieces that need to um, still be gathered on that, including funding. You'll do it. This is the new heyday for your site. Thanks. You're <laughs> really uh, doing incredible things. Charlie? Well, our mission statement is to increase public participation in the American system of self-government through the life story, arts, and culture of an American president. So we seek to do that in innovative and inclusive ways. And as we're assessing what tools we have to be able to accomplish that, um, we had an internal brainstorming session and developed a new initiative um, you know, right at the front end of the pandemic as we were trying to think of these kind of pandemic-proof programs and initiatives that we could undertake. So we started something new called Project POTUS. Um, if you look it up, projectpotus.org, you can find out you know, the full details. But the gist of it is that what we're seeking to do is we're seeking to engage middle school social studies teachers and helping engage their middle school students in learning about the American presidency through the production of one-minute videos on each of the 45 presidents. 
So really utilizing that tool of the one minute videos as a national competition. So they're submitting the videos to us. We've actually pulled together what we call a citizen, well, you can see where the recycle bin comes out, citizen jurors <laughs> um, helping us to actually evaluate these videos. And so we had our pilot program last year and had um, you know, just worked with three schools, again, to get a better sense of how that might work out. Had such a tremendous response that we've officially launched the initiative nationally um, as of President's Day this year. Um, and we're accepting these video submissions through tax day, so I think April 18th. Um, but it's a really powerful initiative, and we're thinking about it in terms of this peer-to-peer -peer education about the American presidency. Because as we have these best videos competitively graded in a crowdsourced way, we feel like it gives us all sorts of opportunities, not just to share the story of Benjamin Harrison, but to think about that story in the larger context of the American presidency. So, I mean, alongside a number of other initiatives that we have underway, and again, I would encourage you to take a look at the, the websites of, you know, many of your peer organizations, because so many different organizations are doing things well. Um, but there, there are a lot of different innovative programs underway. That's great. Christy? So we started not too long before COVID um, something called the American President's Film and Literary Festival. And we did, it, it came out of kind of a conglomeration um, of a couple of organizations coming together in our community who just happen to love film. And we at Hayes Presidential were going through this kind of phase, um, again, as part of our strategic planning process, um, of, of actually how to not think like a museum, <laughs> which we don't, we're still figuring out what that means, but it was a comment that was made to us um, by a member of the community in one of our focus groups. And, you know, we were thinking of non-traditional ways to educate people about civic responsibility, civic engagement, civil discourse, um, the history of the presidency. And, you know, we talked about film and literature and how that's such a great tool for that kind of thing. Um, so we started this and um, it was, it took, it's taken a little while to grow and then we got hit by COVID and so we're still kind of rebounding. But we had such a successful festival last fall. Um, we reached a bigger audience than we ever had before. Um, and we are starting to see films filter in um, that have to deal with a lot of social justice issues um, because that's certainly been a theme in, in all of the presidency, even if those words, those exact words being, weren't being used in our various president, uh, president's administrations. Um, and a woman walked out of one of the screenings and said, how do we get this film in the schools? The film that she had just seen. And it, it was uh, The Reunited States. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. If you search for it online, you, you can watch it online. It's a very powerful documentary. Um, and so we thought, gosh, what, you know, why are we just really kind of targeting an adult, adult audience with this festival? We, there really should be this educational component um, within the schools. And let's truly think about using these films as teaching tools. And um, so we've been having some meetings this spring. Uh, next week, um, Reunited States is going to be in the uh, public schools and private schools in our county. Um, the students are going to be discussing these films, using them as a platform um, to talk about um, you know, these really critical issues <laughs> that are facing all of us. And we hope that this kind of becomes the springboard uh, to make this a festival that truly provides a basis for the conversations um, that we need to have. And um, so we're very excited and, and are looking to this, uh, to the future for this um, being that, um, uh, uh, you know, launching pad for us to move the needle on a lot of these issues that, um, that we need to be talking about and needing to be coming together on. That's great. Uh, we'd like to turn it to you all now. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please step up to the mic. I'm going to kick us off with a question, um, and this is something I was thinking about as we were hearing the last panel talk about uh, um, philanthropy during this period of COVID, and, and now as we emerge from it, and what a joy it is to be in a group of people where we can see everyone's uh, mouths again. Um, Charlie, um, if you would, fr from your experience, would you say that, you know, think, again, thinking about how advancement has been shaped by COVID, how has the engagement with our constituents in our audience been shaped? Would you say they've gotten closer, further away, or a little bit of both? 
you know, outside of this, this discussion, I'm happy to talk to anyone more deeply about this, but we were actually um, in the silent phase of a $6 million capital campaign um, as the pandemic hit. Um, so that could have been very traumatic, and um, through good counsel and through working with our board and donors, um, it actually became a really positive experience. It had many more silver linings than we ever expected, and it also allowed us to focus our attention in different ways and to focus on developing new programming. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that we've been able to do and to develop and advance faster than we anticipated. We're gonna have a Juneteenth Food Waste Festival um, a program that's gonna be launching this June. Um, we've been able to continue to advance our 3D initiatives and being able to share our collection through our website. Um, so it, it's given us a different quality of time you know, engaging with our donors, yes, Zoom is terrible, but it, it does have some time efficiencies to it um, that I think we all recognize. Um, so I'd say it's a different quality of time and it's, it's allowed us to, um, to rethink and reassess. I, I think it's fascinating how at all of our sites the, the metrics we use have changed as a result of this and probably always will and, and how we're measuring success and who's engaging with us. Uh, we have a question over here, I'll start to my left. Fisher, uh, with a question really for all of you. I'm curious, we've heard the last couple of days about so many interesting programs about these 45 people who have sat in this chair. Um, I'm interested in your communities. Are they really just primarily interested in your principal? In other words, Harrison Hayes, Merritt Monroe, et cetera, or the era or the other presidents? What's your research or your experience been about bringing the stories of other presidents to your institution? Can, can I start off? Sure, Charlie. So I think a lesson that we can all learn from and remember is that the presidents we represent are locally relevant, nationally significant. So there's a duality to our organizations and the way that we're embedded in our communities that I think has some ubiquity. So it's, I think where conversations like this can be so powerful because we can learn these lessons from each other and apply them within our own communities because there's this enormous interest in the American presidency. Mm -hmm. And yes, we can share the story of our president, um, but then it has broader application. Yeah. Sarah, Christy, you want to add? Yeah, just real briefly, I'll say yes, exactly that. And that manifests also in um, using these presidents to invite people to explore American history, mm -hmm. full stop, whether that's local, regional, or national, um, and the, the threads, the themes, the topics of American history. Just, um, you know, presidential history has a certain draw. And we, we welcome people interested in presidential history, and we hope to give them that and more. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just add, from my perspective at the Virginia State History Museum, being the home to more presidents than any other state, that uh, people seem fascinated to sort of line them up, right? The analysis of one or the other. And because there's so few of them, the, the context is sort of shaped by them uh, collectively. That's, and I would just say, I think our film and literary festival is a good example because it doesn't just focus on Hayes. In fact, I don't even think in the few years that we've done it, we've actually really done anything on Hayes. It's been other presidents. And people are fascinated by it. But, I, you know, I think they're fascinated by the presidents, but also the topics and the issues that those yeah. presidents face, mm -hmm. which still have ripple effects no matter when that person was president, still have ripple effects on us today. So, it, you know, they're relating to the topics as well and the issues as well as the president. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a construct for American history, no doubt. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Over here. Hi, uh, Kent Gray from Springfield, Illinois. So my home uh, presidential site is President Lincoln's uh, home and tomb and then the, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, of which I was a docent at for three years, which is kind of a fun thing to do uh, to actually see people interact with everything that our sites uh, do for stuff. But I'm also an old White House staffer for a couple administrations, and I'm a collector. And the thing that I collect is presidential Christmas cards. So I wanted to throw out there, uh, one is a question of uh, most of the sites have a temporary uh, exhibit facility of some sort. What has been most successful over the years that people have seen that, that really draw people in? And then a shameless plug for my collection. Um, so, and I'm not trying to sell anything. <laughs> Anita's like, is this for sale? I'm like, no, 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 no. I just have all this stuff. 
So, um, so I, I collect, I have all the presidential Christmas cards from Hoover to the present. And uh, about a third of them are up in my room in 1021. And I will be up there from 4 to 5 and from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. So if you're looking for a temporary exhibit for your site, come and talk to me and we can talk about something that's interesting. And I think it's useful to you because I would assume that December and January are tough months to get anyone into your sites. And Christmas mm -hmm. is a good reason to bring them in. And Christmas cards are a pretty uh, topical thing around Christmas. So, But my question really is on what's worked for you for temporary exhibits? So relationships, relationships, relationships. It's been so important for us as a small organization to draw from relationships in our community. So we've been able to partner with IUPUI. We have an initiative called the New Century Curator Initiative where we're drawing specifically from their graduate level museum studies program to help us look at our collection with fresh eyes and to make sure that we're keeping, we have two new exhibits every year, um, but it allows us then to, to delve into that collection and share it in ways that we might not otherwise. So we just opened in January a new exhibit called No Compact of Silence, Black Civil Rights Advocates in the Harrison Era. It's just a really powerful examination of that time period and the work, the really important work that was taking place that, like Harrison, is underknown. Christy? I'm looking at my staff because I think they know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Cryptids. <laughs> Uh, and I should mention that we had an exhibit at the same time uh, called Press and the Presidency. Uh, so we do serious topics too. And this, this took me, it, it took some convincing um, for me to do, <laughs> to approve this topic. If you don't know what cryptids are, um, they're mythical creatures. And uh, the connection, as you might be wondering, to President Hayes was uh, he wrote in his diary about how much he loved stories about giants when he was a kid. Um, and so Ohio does have many of wonderful mythical stories about you know monster sightings in Lake Erie and the dog man of defiance and we share with West Virginia the Mothman. Um, <laughs> so we did an exhibit on Ohio cryptids and talk about reaching a different audience. Um, we did. <laughs> uh, but it's been amazing. Um, we because and we our folk our approach to it was kind of looking at the folklore and why do these stories fascinate us and you know that kind of thing, um, but we've we've sold the exhibit content to the Ohio History Connection. They were so taken with the story and they want to use it uh, for a more permanent application. And actually, um, a couple of our staff members have been asked to write a book. Um, about these stories. So it had, I was really hesitant, I almost put the gabosh to it, but it's reached a larger audience and had a longer life than I could have anticipated. That's <laughs> <laughs> classified. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have one final question from a familiar face over here to the left. Hi, I'm Linnea Grimm from Monticello. Um, so I was struck by something that Christy said at the beginning about the power of saying no. And I was wondering, kind of one of those lightning type questions for everybody about what's something you said no to that you're really grateful you said no to um, as inspiration to remind all of us it is good to say no to some ideas sometimes. And if that something doesn't come to mind, what is the rubric you put something through in order to say yes or no? Big question. That's I'm, great. I'm in a big frame while my colleagues think. Um, which is that uh, the list of no is probably bigger than the list of yes at this point. But this is a, a COVID growth thing and a sort of recognizing of, of budget and staff is that um, f for this year, I'm working very intentionally with my team on specific projects. And I have said the words of our year is full. Uh, right? So unless it's one of the projects that I've already defined for us and it fits into certain avenues of where we hope to be, we're not taking on new. Um, and this, this is, you know, with a, with a small staff, and, and a small staff means six full-time people, okay? Um, a small staff can't do everything. And for about nine years, I said, let's cover as many bases as we can. Let's juggle as much, spin as many plates, whatever you want to think of. Um, let's try to cover everything to really move it to the next level. An underdeveloped site that's really worthy, let's just work as hard as we can. Right now, we are trying to focus, trying to build team, trying to um, build the collaboration where if I'm out, someone can cover. If someone else is out, I can cover so that we're overlapping a lot more and, and strengthening 
in this way. It's a complete mind shift for me, um, and it, it, may, it may save us, and it may give us a successful year. Um, I, I can just quickly say that we, we aren't always the best at saying no. I think sometimes my team wishes that I were better at saying no, and you can hear them laughing <laughs> over there. Um, and I think, I think it's always a discernment process. So maybe as much as N-O, but K-N-O-W, just know your limitations. And so that's something, that's the process we're going through with a new strategic plan and having successfully completed the fundraising side of a capital campaign and now executing on all of that construction, just really honing in on our greatest strengths. Yeah, I, gosh, what a great question, Linnea. Um, and I would agree with her, you know, the list is so long. Um, but I think, you know, we, we have said some no to some projects that people proposed that have made us very sad. Um, and But again, I think you hope that, that it's really just tabled for the right moment. Um, we I do call it like our Swiss cheese approach as, as far as how do we determine what are we gonna do, what are we not. We always go back to the strategic plan but we always are also thinking about what can we provide, what can this partner provide, what can, you know, and, and if you layer up those pieces of Swiss cheese, right, you fill in all the gaps and you, you've got some solidity there. So that's kind of the way we look at partnerships and because through partnerships, sometimes you, and, and when the right partnership presents itself, sometimes you can pull out that idea and go, aha, may, maybe now's the right, the right time to do it. So sometimes it's a timing thing, sometimes it's, you know, it is being realistic about what your resources are and uh, hopefully just, just tabling and not completely canceling. Charlie, did you have a quick follow-up? Well, I, I was just gonna say, um, as a matter of saying yes, um, and again, I'm putting my team on the spot here, um, as we're moving forward with our Project POTUS initiative, we are going to be looking for additional citizen jurors. So if anyone has interest in helping us crowd rate these videos, um, poor Molly, our um, Russell and Penny Fortune presidential fellow, um, would be happy to take your name if you have an interest. Um, we are going to be looking to draw from a lot of presidential expertise to make sure that we have the absolute strongest videos for each of these presidents. So, Wonderful. Well, I'd like to congratulate all three of you for the creativity you've brought to your sites and bringing forward these important stories and, and doing it so wisely. So I think the, the future looks very bright um, for each of you. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you, too, for framing and moderating a wonderful conversation. This was terrific, really grateful uh, to each of you. Um, and also, Bob, thank you for your introduction and framing a great example of, of a partnership between the White House Historical Association and the National Trust in preserving the Decatur House. Um, Christy and Charlie, Sarah and Jamie, excellent conversation. And I love how you ended in, in the final question, which really said no, both N-O and K-N-O-W can be part of the strategic plan um, for the long-term viability and, um, and future of your organizations. This was really terrific. Your perspectives and sharing your insights is a wonderful way to end our, the formal sessions of, of, the, of the summit today. The last two days have been incredible. Everyone has taken a lot of notes. We've taken a lot of feedback. Expect to hear from us at the White House Historical Association like we did in 2018, a survey of all of you for feedback on, on the summit. And we want to stay connected. We want to uh, have your input for the planning for the next one, and of which we need to determine as a board when that uh, will be. We've already said to you, do we do it in a year or do we do it in two years? It will be in Washington, so you, you know that that is coming. But the, all the formal sessions have now come to a conclusion. Uh, it has been a really extraordinary uh, two and a half days. It feels, to, Stuart and I were saying it, it feels today like it's been three weeks <laughs> already, but, uh, but it's been worth every single minute. So the final housekeeping uh, note is, you know, we still have a few surprises up our sleeve for tonight's program at AT&T Stadium. So uh, go rest up for an hour or whatever yeah, you need to do to be on the bus at five o'clock uh, out in front and we'll head out to AT&T Stadium. But thank you, fantastic panel. Charlie, did you have something? And can we give another round of applause to Anita, to yeah. Stewart, oh, to the whole Happy Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remember to visit our booths and White House his History Shop. Shuttles will depart tonight at 5 p.m. for AT&T Stadium.